Okay, so we, we've talked about how to create a tree. But once, once you've got that tree, you've got to think about it a little bit. So let's talk about how to interpret a tree. Here's a phylogenetic tree uh, of great apes. This is taken from, it's more or less correct. It's, it's a bit of a simplification and not entirely up to date. So what are the parts of this tree? You've got terminal nodes. Some people call these leaves, right? It's the leaf of a tree. These represent the sequences you included in your analysis. Most of the time, these are all modern sequences, right? Unless you're working with uh, extracting sequences from museum samples or ancient environments of some kind, all of these sequences come from living creatures, and so they're all modern. You have internal nodes. Each of these represents a last common ancestor. So the last common ancestor of gorillas is right here. The last common ancestor uh, of the, um, I don't even know what you call these, that uh, the chimps, gorillas, and humans is right here. The last of the given siamang group is here, and the last common ancestor of all the great apes is here. Now, this, in order to determine where that node is, you have to have an outgroup, right? And that outgroup may have been, you know, the world monkeys, for example, to which the apes are related. And then you've got branches that connect them. This particular kind of a tree is called a phenogram. In a phenogram, you have a directional axis. In this case, that is time. Now, you can't determine time from a molecular phylogenetic analysis. Because in that, that case, the axis represents evolutionary distance, not time, right? And you have to have something else to lock that tree into a time scale, maybe a fossil record or something like that. It's also true that molecular sequences don't evolve all at the same rate in the same branches. So you wouldn't expect them all to come out exactly in the same here. In, in, the, in a phenogram, it's the, dis the vertical distance or whatever the axis is, horizontal or vertical distance, that, that represents change. And so I can spread these out all I want and change that, and nothing changes in terms of the number it represents. In this case, time going vertically. Root branches, terminal nodes, and then you've got a scale bar that tells you how to measure it. Here's another representation of that same tree. I've just flipped the scale over on its side, right? And instead of drawing nice brackets, I've got lines to show that. But it's still time scale, and it's only the horizontal distance that measures anything. The evolutionary distance between this last common ancestor here and this other common ancestor isn't this length, but this length right here. That's the difference between a pentagram and what I'll talk about again at the Denver. Notice that I can do all kinds of manipulations with this tree to make a point without changing the tree itself. In this case, I put humans on top. If you go to a museum, humans are always on top of the tree, right? Um, in this case, I mix it up so that I don't do that. I've made an explicit choice not to put humans on, uh, at the top. I'm, I'm mixing it up. But these are the same trees because the connectivity between all those branches is the same. And the node, position of the nodes on the scale is the same. And so when I flip this part of the tree, when I flip this part, and then flip this part, and then flip this one, nothing changes in the tree. It's just the representation of the tree that changes. More natural, perhaps, are the dendrograms. These are the things that come straight out of the analysis, the kind of trees I showed you at the very beginning when you saw them. Here, evolutionary distance is measured along the branches. And you can show them splayed out like this, or you can pull out, in this case, the root is somewhere in here, and you pull it out and show the, show the branches along here. I can move these branches in any direction I want as long as the length of the branches stays the same and the connectivity stays the same. So if I measure, for example, 
from humans to gibbons, and I measure along this br these branches to, ter to determine their evolutionary distance. They should be the same as if I measure along here. And that's it. You can arrange these in any way that you want. The key then is to remember that, that that's how the trees work. And so if I want to know the evolutionary distance between lowland chimps and lowland gorillas, I measure along those branches in a dendrogram. And it doesn't matter how I draw it, it should be the same. In a phenogram, in this particular case, horizontal distance is the, horizontal distance is the measure. And so if I measure from lowland gorillas back to the common ancestor, and then out to lowland chimps, some of these two numbers ought to equal the evolutionary distance. I'm not measuring any vertical brackets because those aren't meaningful. Yeah. It should say or be clear. Unfortunately, these bracket notations are ambiguous. They can be either way. Um, generally speaking, um, if, it, if it shows you know, these right angle brackets, it's a pentagram. Whoops, and if it does, if it doesn't, then it's a dendrogram. But that's not always true. These can sometimes be pentagrams as well. Yeah, so, so here's, a, here's an example of that. This is a dendrogram because of the assumption. I mean, in the case of time, it has to be. Oh, excuse me, a pentagram. And so this is an interesting case. So this is a dendrogram of that same tree I showed you. Notice there's no time scale on this, because in a molecular analysis, the time isn't part of the process. Notice that the branches don't come all out the same. There's a bit of a, yeah, that's right. This has to do with differences in evolutionary rate, at least of the molecules you're studying. And so for this molecule, humans have undergone more evolutionary change than bonobos. There are terms for this. And they're terrible terms because they're, they're, they can be very misleading. The term here would be that, for example, looking at the two species of chimps, the lowland chimps are more primitive than bonobos. But that's only true for this sequence, right? That may not be true for other traits. Um, and bonobos are more advanced or more highly derived than lowland chimps for this trait. If an organism is more like the common ancestor in a variety of traits, then oftentimes people will say that the organism is primitive as a whole. But this is really dangerous. So for example, uh, sharks. In terms of their cytoskeletal structure, sharks are primitive. Sharks are more similar to the common ancestor of fish than are teleos, for example. But in terms of their electrosensory perception, they are far more advanced than teleos. And so it's, it's really easy to get trapped into this primitive, advanced notion and start, it starts to become a judgment of them. And one of the things I've, I've counted on you guys is that there's no such thing as, as, as these kind of judgments in science. And so, yeah, humans are more advanced in a variety of morphological traits than chimps. They are also more advanced in terms of ribosomal sequences. But for any particular trait you looked at, you look at, you may find that chimps are, are, are more advanced than humans. And likewise, for any kind of creature you might look at. So, so use the term primitive or advanced very, very carefully. Remember that you're talking about the specific traits you're measuring and not everything else. And they're using it as a, as a description of relative evolutionary distance.